What's going on in the last 24 hours of the Israel-Hamas war? The total number of Palestinians killed in the Gaza Strip since the war began crossed 28,000 is now 28,064. The Al-Quds brigades of the Palestinian Islamic Jihad reported a range of operations that they carried out against IDF forces in Han Yunus. Minister Netanyahu of Israel has instructed the IDF to prepare the Rafah operation such that it will be concluded by the beginning of Ramadan. Rockets targeted the area today of Kiryat Shmona, where a building was hit by an anti-tank missile as well. There also Hello, I am Alon Burstein, visiting assistant professor in the Department of Political Science and Israel Institute fellow at the University of California, Irvine, here bringing you the summary of the last 24 hours of the Israel-Hamas war. It is currently the evening of February 10th, 2024 in the United States, the morning of February 11th, 2024 in the Middle East. Starting with the hostage situation, today there were reports in Israel regarding the meeting of Israel's war cabinet that precipitated Israel's decision to boycott the ongoing negotiations in Cairo. According to the report, on Thursday the war cabinet met, and in it they drafted an Israeli proposal that would be returned to negotiators. The proposal included three demands from Israel, one that any hostage deal adhere to the issues that were agreed upon in the Paris summit, i.e. Israel seeking to reject Hamas's inclusion of facets such as Jews' rights to enter the Temple Mount or Haram al-Sharif in Jerusalem, or the conditions of Palestinian prisoners. Two, Israel insists on formulating the key of releasing Palestinian prisoners already in phase one that relates to how many Palestinian prisoners will be released in exchange for each Israeli hostage. Israel wants to negotiate that in the first phase, not in the last phase. And three, that Israel insists on releasing quote-unquote heavy Palestinian prisoners, i.e. those prisoners who either are leaders of terror organizations or who are sentenced in Israel for life for different acts of violence, only in the phase where the Hamas also releases IDF soldiers, i.e. Israel's not agreeing to release in the first phase, only later on. Reportedly, Minister Eisenkot of the War Cabinet wanted Israel to answer this officially, so to participate in the Cairo agreements from afar by sending this document. However, Prime Minister Netanyahu insisted on first debating this in the larger cabinet in Israel, and thus Israel gave no official answer. In other news, in an attempt to break the stalemate of the ongoing negotiations, Qatar, Egypt, and the United States have been working together on a platform, reportedly under the auspices of CIA Director William Barnes, Qatari Prime Minister Mohammed bin Abdul Thani, as well as the Egyptian Intelligence Minister Abbas Kamel, in order to allow negotiations to resume, possibly already on Tuesday. It was reported today that the CIA Director William Barnes is going to travel to Cairo in the coming days. Israel has stated that it is not going to return to negotiations unless Hamas presents a more reasonable counteroffer, and Israel is pressuring both Qatar and Egypt to in turn apply pressure on Hamas in order to do so. It was also reported today in Al Arabi Al Jadid that the Hamas delegation that was negotiating in Egypt is going to travel to Qatar in order to consult the Movement's Political Bureau, however likely also to consult the Qatari negotiators, before returning to Cairo. What we see in this is that in fact the negotiations not only are stalled, but that all sides are actually working on just getting the parties to the table right now. Israel gave its terms, Hamas gave its terms, Israel is stating that Hamas's terms are so far-fetched such that they're not even going to come to the negotiating table, and right now all the parties involved are just trying to come up with some sort of platform to get the sides to work together in order to maybe come up with a hostage deal later on. At this point it seems a lot farther than it was several days ago. Moving on to the ongoing fighting in the Gaza Strip, there were no rockets or mortars sent from the Gaza Strip into Israel in the last 24 hours. Regarding the fighting in the Gaza Strip, in the northern parts of the Gaza Strip, there's ongoing fighting in the Al-Shati refugee camp as the IDF continues its expansive operation there. There were no specific reports about incidents that occurred, however, gun battles were reported throughout the entire refugee camp as well as in the areas of Beit Lahia. In the central parts of the Gaza Strip and Deir al-Balah, the Palestinian Red Crescent reported that four Palestinians were killed and eight more were wounded in a bombing in the al haqqa region of the city. It was not reported specifically what was targeted in this bombing, however, the city has been receiving more idea of bombings in the last several days. Moving on to the southern parts of the Gaza Strip, where most of the fighting is concentrated in Han Yunis, the IDF was reportedly operating with intensive gun battles around the Nasser Hospital in the area. Yesterday and two days ago, it was reported that the IDF was operating the El Amal Hospital, also in the western parts of Han Yunis. It may be that the IDF is preparing to operate also in the Nasser Hospital, unclear at this time. Other news, the IDF commando units reportedly took over several Hamas sites in the western parts of Han Yunis, uncovering a lot of weaponry. These included both guns, RPGs, mortars, and a lot of other intelligence materials. The Al-Quds brigades of the Palestinian Islamic Jihad reported a range of operations that they carried out against IDF forces in Han Yunis. 
These included firing missiles at a home where IDF soldiers were held up, firing mortars at IDF in the Al-Hawaz region of western Han Yunis, as well as intensive gun battles throughout the western parts and also in the heart of the city of Han Yunis. In turn, in Rafah, which is the most southern city in Han Yunis, there were substantial airstrikes reported throughout the day, including three against a series of buildings that AP reported killed at least 28 Palestinians, including 10 children. In addition, there were two attacks carried out against police cars in Rafah. In the first one, occurring in the Tengsultan refugee camp, three senior figures in Hamas's police force in Rafah were assassinated. These include Ahmed El Yaqubi. He's a Hamas operative who's in charge of security arrangements for the senior officials of Hamas and also in charge of investigations in the areas of Rafah. Ayman Rantisi, who's a senior in Hamas's security intelligence, and Ibrahim Shatat, who's also a senior figure in the police force. There was a second attack against a police car that also reportedly killed several people. However, it was not reported who were the targets of that assassination or assassination attempt. Other news related to the Gaza Strip. The IDF reportedly uncovered today Hamas's main communications hub of servers in a tunnel underneath the UNRWA he- headquarters in Rimal of Gaza City. This was described by the IDF as an intelligence gold mine, as this is the main network of Hamas's internal communications array. The cables connecting the servers to UNRWA's communication room above the tunnel were cut prior to the IDF uncovering the area. The IDF claims this was done only after the place was abandoned, however this cannot be substantiated. Responding to this, the head of UNRWA, Philip Lazzarini, put out a tweet today stating that UNRWA had no knowledge of this tunnel. The IDF has in turn stated in several different interviews, it is highly unlikely that UNRWA would not know that Hamas was building a tunnel under the main headquarters of UNRWA in the Gaza Strip, in the northern parts of Gaza City, that includes also connecting to their communication arrays and to their electric grid. Other news relating to the Gaza Strip, there was a lot of different reports today regarding Israel's seeming impeding operation in the, in the Rafah area. CNN reported today that Prime Minister Netanyahu of Israel has instructed the IDF to prepare the Rafah operation such that it will be concluded by the beginning of Ramadan. The Ramadan is going to start roughly around March 10th or March 11th. This means that, at least as far as the political establishment is ordering the IDF, the entire operation in Rafah, which includes mass evacuation of well over one or one and a half million Palestinian civilians and taking over the city and destroying at least four Hamas battalions is supposed to take less than one month. In Israel, there was reportedly disagreement in the last 24 hours between Prime Minister Netanyahu and Chief of Staff Herzi Halevi, as Netanyahu ordered Halevi to begin drafting reserve units to the IDF for the operation in Rafah, while Halevi in turn responded that first, the political establishment needs to decide what is to be done with the 1.3 million Palestinians who are in Rafah city itself, let alone the refugee camps around the area, and that the political establishments need to coordinate the operation with Egypt. In addition, visiting soldiers in the field today, Chief of Staff Halevi announced that the fighting in Han Yunus is very successful, but is still far from over. This despite Prime Minister Netanyahu's statements earlier in the week that the IDF is a hair's breadth away from completing victory in the city of Han Yunus. This again is another indication that there might be disagreements between the Chief of Staff of the IDF regarding concluding the operation in Han Yunus and moving on to Rafah, as opposed to the desires of Prime Minister Netanyahu. In addition, the mayor of Rafah today put out a statement stating that there are one million internally displaced people in a 20 square kilometer radius in the city and that humanitarian aid is only satisfying roughly 10% of their need. He stated that if the IDF invades Rafah, it will be an absolute bloodbath. Relating to this, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, and the United Arab Emirates all put out statements today warning of Israel's impeding operation in Rafah. Qatar explicitly called on the UN Security Council to stop Israel from invading and, I quote, carrying out a genocide in the area. Saudi Arabia also called on the UN Security Council to intervene. In addition, the New York Times reported that Egypt informed Israel that if Gazans are expelled to Sinai as a result of this operation, this will be in violation of the peace treaty between the countries, and Egypt is even threatening to officially suspend the the peace treaty between Egypt and Israel. If this becomes a fact, it was also reported in the last several days that Egypt has not only been amplifying its security in the area and strengthening its concrete wall between the areas of Egypt, Egyptian Sinai and Rafah in the Gaza Strip, but also that Egypt is even considering laying down landmines in order to stop a mass evacuation of Palestinians into the Sinai Peninsula. Regarding casualties, no IDF soldiers reported killed in the Gaza Strip in the last 24 hours. The total number of IDF soldiers that were killed in the Gaza Strip since the invasion began remains 227. Seven IDF soldiers reported injured in the Gaza Strip in the last 24 hours. The total number of IDF soldiers injured in the Gaza Strip since the invasion began is 1,319. 
The Palestinian Health Ministry in the Gaza Strip is reporting 117 Palestinians killed in the Gaza Strip in the last 24 hours. The total number of Palestinians killed in the Gaza Strip since the war began crossed 28,000. It is now 28,064. 67,611 Palestinians are reported injured in the Gaza Strip. There are still several thousand buried under the rubbles and the destroyed roads and presumed dead. Moving on to the humanitarian situation in the Gaza Strip, the IDF announced today that in coordination with international aid agencies, it delivered over 20 oxygen balloons and other medical equipment to the El Amal Hospital in Han Yunis. I remind everyone that, as I stated earlier, the IDF entered the hospital yesterday after it obtained intelligence information that Hamas was operating in it. Dozens of Palestinians were reportedly arrested. The IDF is now stating that it also delivered medical equipment and these 20 oxygen balloons. In addition to that, there was also an intensifying fighting around the Nasser Hospital that resulted and several Palestinians being injured. However, there was no report that the IDF has actually entered the hospital. There were also no reports given regarding the entrance of aid trucks to the Gaza Strip in the last 24 hours. In the last two weeks, there's been very sporadic reports regarding the entrance of aid trucks. This has, this has largely at least correlated with protests in Israel that were trying to stop the aid trucks from entering. It is unclear at this point how many aid trucks entered the Gaza Strip in the last 24 hours. Moving on to the West Bank, there was substantial IDF activity reported in several different parts of the West Bank in the last 24 hours. These include the areas of Nablus, Hebron, the Azun area, and Kalkilia. A total of 14 Palestinians were reported arrested in these various different IDF operations, and several Palestinians are injured in the different confrontations. Other news related to the West Bank. Following the United States and Canada, the EU is now pushing to sanction several different violent settler activists in the West Bank, although th this requires a unanimous decision in the EU that is currently being blocked by Hungary and the Czech Republic. However, there were concerns reported in Israel that eventually those two countries may become convinced, which will add to mounting pressure on the, the Israeli political establishment to actually rein in the violent settler activity and bring these settlers to justice in Israel. In addition to this, there was a report leaked today from Israel's foreign office warning about an intention of the Biden administration to possibly sanction IDF soldiers in the West Bank if the IDF legal office does not supply the administration with information about their prosecution for carrying out illegal acts of violence against Palestinians within 60 days. If this were to happen, this would be quite an escalation in the diplomatic blows between the countries, it is one thing if the United States has now started to sanction Israeli settlers in the West Bank. However, if they start to sanction IDF soldiers for activities that they carried out presumably on duty, this would lead to a much harsher reaction from Israel's right-wing elements, which would in turn probably lead Netanyahu to another escalation and confrontation with President Biden. Moving on to the northern parts of Israel, southern parts of Lebanon, there were continuous rockets and missiles sent from Lebanon targeting the northern parts of Israel today. As in the last several days, escalations have continued with substantial barrages. Rockets targeted the areas today of Kiryat Shmona, where a building was hit by an anti-tank missile as well. There were also rockets sent towards the Upper Galilee, areas of Zarit, Granota Galil, Arab Aral Ramshe, Shomra, Evan Menachem, Goren, Ramon Naftali. Rockets were also sent towards the Western Galilee, the areas of Batsat, Shlomi, Hanita, Ya'ara, and Rosh Nikra. In the Kibbutz Darim in southern Upper Galilee, there was also a rocket sent, and this is fairly, fairly uncommon. It is far than Hezbollah usually sends its rockets. There was also an interception reported in the area of Tiberias. Regarding the IDF activity, three Hezbollah command centers were attacked by the IDF warplanes in the Anakora area and in Ita Ashaab, and a Hezbollah infrastructure was also targeted in Al Hiyam and in Meruhin. In addition, there were also attacks carried out against the Batsan village. In addition to this, in Benjbel, IDF reportedly attacked a military structure, and Hezbollah lookout post was also attacked in the Markaba area. Lebanese sources also stated that three Syrian citizens were injured in Al Hiyam. It was not reported if these were affiliates of Hezbollah, uh, if these were also affiliates somehow of the Iranian Revolutionary Guards, or what is the connection of these three Syrian citizens. Other news related to the IDF activity, there was an assassination attempt carried out today in the Jadra area north of Tzidon. This drones reportedly launched three missiles attacking the car of Basel Tzalal, who's a prominent Hamas figure in Lebanon, who's in charge of recruiting Palestinians in the West Bank to operate for Hamas. He reportedly survived the assassination attempt, but was injured to an unknown degree. Three people were reportedly killed. Reports varied, stating that they are Hezbollah members, Hamas members, or unaffiliated. In addition to this, the Iranian Foreign Minister Hussein Amir Abdullahan is currently visiting Lebanon. He met with Lebanese Prime Minister Najim Mikati, Lebanese Foreign Minister Abdallah Bo Habib, as well as with Hezbollah leader Hassan Nasrallah. Following their meetings, the Lebanese Foreign Minister stated Lebanon does not want a war and presented to Iranian Foreign Minister the political vision for implementing UN Security Council Resolution 1701, that is the Security Council Resolution that ended the war between the sides in 2006, that was meant to 
push Hezbollah north of the border with Israel, but it was never implemented. In addition, after meeting the Hezbollah leader, Abdulihan stated that Israel cannot even begin to imagine Hezbollah's strength, and that the region is headed towards stability, security, and political solutions, despite what Netanyahu wants. So while the Iranian foreign minister is meeting with Hezbollah leader, his statements after that actually, while stating that Hezbollah is much stronger than Israel recognizes, actually said the region is headed towards stability, which is the gates of Netanyahu once. This may be reflecting what he heard from Prime Minister Najim Mikati or from Lebanese Foreign Minister. Moving on to the political and general trends in the last 24 hours, there were continuous political protests in Israel today, including road blockings of the major highways around Tel Aviv, all calling for Israel to carry out a hostage exchange deal at any price. These protests are largely led by the family members of the different hostages. However, several thousand people also participated in these different protests. There were, at the same time, parallel protests that were also calling for overthrowing the government and instilling a new prime minister in light of what was called the failures of the war and the failures of October 7th. Other news, Israel's finance minister and leader of religious Zionism, Bezal Smotrich, today responded again to the downgrade that the Moody's credit agency gave to Israel's credit rating. He stated that there was absolutely no economic considerations in this downgrade, but rather this is a political manifesto that is meant to pressure Israel to create a Palestinian state. Other political news, there was a report today that the family members of Israeli hostages are planning to submit an official lawsuit against Hamas leaders in the ICC on charges of crimes against humanity involving kidnapping, forced disappearing, sexual violence, torture, and other charges. Their aim and their hope is that international arrest warrants will be issued for the leaders of Hamas, which will in turn apply more pressure on Hamas to come to a hostage deal, possibly in order to negotiate the dropping of these charges. I will note that while Israel is in court in the International Court of Justice, the ICJ, it, Hamas cannot be brought to, brought to court in the ICJ because it's not a country. However, the ICC allows people to be brought to court on an individual basis rather than a country basis, and thus the leaders of Hamas can be brought to justice in the ICC. Other political news, Israeli opposition leader Yair Lapid met with the French Prime Minister Gabriel Attal today. In their meeting, he discussed applying pressure on Hamas in order to achieve a hostage deal as well as the Lebanese diplomatic efforts. Other political news, President Biden today issued a presidential order titled National Security Memo stating that the United States selling weapons to allies will from now on be conditioned on those allies pledging to operate in accordance with international rules of war, respecting humanitarian rights, lowering the risk of harming civilians, and granting humanitarian aid. Countries that will, will be required to supply written assurances and the Secretaries of State and Defense in the United States will supply Congress with periodic reports on this, adding that countries that do not live up to this may have their military aid suspended within 45 days. Now, this memo does not explicitly reference Israel, however, it does not exclude Israel either, and there was a lot of concern raised in Israel. On the one hand, the IDF is stating that it is abiding by the rules of war, so there's nothing to be concerned about. On the other hand, it is very clear that this memo is being issued while there is increasing, growing frustration within the Biden administration of Israel's military activity, and it is very obvious that this is part of of the escalatory rhetoric between the two countries and another pressure valve the United States may use in order to say, as a result of this presidential order, military aid may be suspended or conditioned or limited towards Israel as the war goes on. Moving on to the future of the Gaza Strip and related to this, the New York Times reported today that one of President Biden's senior aides, Deputy National Security Advisor John Finer, was recorded in a private meeting with Arab American leaders in Michigan, stating and acknowledging mistakes of the administration in response to the war in Gaza. He added that he does not have any confidence that Israel's government is willing to take any meaningful steps towards Palestinian statehood, and this adds to more indications that the Biden administration is starting to reconsider how it is relating to Israel in terms of the future of the war, possibly the ongoing invasion into Rafah, and what are the plans for the day after, and the growing frustration and basically running out of patience for Netanyahu simply saying what is not going to be in the Gaza Strip, but not coming up with a plan for what is going to be there in the future. If you have any questions or, or comments, please feel free to add them in the comment section below. As well, if you enjoyed this, please give a like, subscribe, and send this video to whoever you think might, be might benefit from it. That is my report for the last 24 hours. I'll be back tomorrow.